Thanks. Thanks. So uh, we're, we're going to look at the physical properties of the weather. The way the way on, the uh, overall aim is to prove this uh, equivalence of category. Uh, Bana for all the human spaces, so complete all the human spaces, and the convex compact household spaces with this separation property. We have seen last time there is an objection. Uh, counters going in both directions, uh, taking states from all the human spaces. Please note there's no completeness here yet, no Barnard uh, requirement. And in the uh, other direction, you take applying continuous maps to the reals. We've seen that the unit of this injunction uh, that is starting from a convex compact space, <coughs> space uh, with an isomorphism with this uh, construction. So that means going this way. This way around, you get, in, uh, you get basically the same space back. And uh, the aim is now to do the same thing here and get a property that amounts to showing that the co unit of this uh, uh, adjunction is also an isomorphism. Uh, so it, it takes uh, all the unit space to its state and then the affine continuous functions in the space. And this is basically the double dual map. Our plan is first to show that this one is injective and then that it's surjective. There's of course a bit more to show uh, uh, here that it's continuous and fine, etc. Et oh, oh, sorry, that is a map on all the human spaces, but I will skip those details. The surjectivity will be proven via this prime smoothing theorem, which is a uh, rather special theorem in functional analysis. Uh, let me start with some basic uh, results about all the human spaces, and I'll just list them without proof, just to, to give you an idea of what kind of things can be proven in such spaces. So each element can be <coughs> split into a difference of two positive elements. Uh, recall we have an order here. The splitting is by no way uh, uh, unique. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, there's this norm that you can define, and it's fairly well behaved that the vector is squeezed in between the norm multiplied with the uh, unit. These are properties that you also find in C-stair algebra. It's nice that you can prove them already for these weaker structures. If a map, a positive linear map, <coughs> not necessarily uni unitop, but if it's zero on the unit, then it must be zero everywhere. That's a useful property. And if I have a positive unit <coughs> to functional, then it's automatically bounded, and its bound is given by a row of one. And thus, if it's unit old, then uh, it's norm is uh, one. Uh, each non-zero positive uh, linear map can be turned into a state, can be forced to be unit old by uh, multiplying it with an appropriate factor. And you, you simply divide by one over rho of one. And here the non-zero aspect is important because, <coughs> because of this uh, uh, property. And uh, uh, so this idea of turning positive, oh, positive maps into states will be used uh, uh, later. And the final property is that if, uh, if uh, the vector V is squeezed between minus W and plus uh, W, then the norms uh, uh, are ordered in an appropriate way. All well-behaved properties, but uh, the, <coughs> the interesting thing is that they hold in these relatively weak structures. Stronger properties can be uh, obtained using Han Barnack style uh, uh, results, and they look like this. <coughs> if I have a linear subspace and a state on this linear subspace, here I have to require that one is in the state, <coughs> then this uh, uh, state can be extended to the whole space. Um, <coughs> And this one is important. Each, uh, each uh, uh, functional can be written as a difference of two positive uh, maps. Recall, I showed this only of vectors on the previous slide, but it actually holds for functions. This is a property that I will use uh, in a minute. Uh, an element is positive if and only if it's, uh, it's positive when applied to a state. Again, this is a very important uh, property. Uh, <coughs> if two elements are different, then they can be distinguished by a state, important separation property. And finally, the norm can be 
uh, expressed as a, as a join uh, over all these uh, absolute values uh, with, um, that you get by applying states. Good. <coughs> now let's look at the full unit itself. We, our aim is to prove that it's an isomorphism or first show that it's an isometry and the fact that it preserves and reflects the order. Now the fact that it's an isometry follows fairly directly from this property. It basically this property says already that, the, uh, that it's an isometry. I'll focus on the second uh, property and I'll briefly show you the proof. So if W of V is less than W of V prime, what this is mean, we're talking about a pointwise order. So that means that uh, for each state, uh, this order relation must hold. But if <coughs> we now fill in what this means, this simply says that omega of V is less than omega of V prime for each state. Or well, we saw on the previous slide that this precisely means that V is less than V prime. V prime. So indeed I have preservation of many reflections. Good. Uh, it's an isomorphism. This is the, the, uh, the main uh, result that can be traced back then to uh, Richard Garrison. And this is the most uh, complicated part of the whole thing I will be talking about. The only if part is easy because these F1 continuous maps are always complete. So if you have an isomorphism, that V is itself uh, complete. In the other direction, <coughs> You have to do more work, and the strategy is as follows. So, suppose I have an element in here, a phi, which is an affine continuous function on the states. I want to show that this map is an isomorphism, so I have to find a vector of v where this map uh, phi comes from. Okay, <coughs> now phi works on states to the, to the real numbers, and it's affine and continuous. These states are included in the continuous and bounded linear functional. And the strategy is to try and extend this phi to a phi overline, which is weakly continuous. And then a result comes back that I uh, talked about in the first lecture, that uh, uh, the, you know, this duality result for normal spaces, that we is uh, isomorphic to the continuous dual of its, of its bounded dual. <coughs> now, uh, I have this phi and I want to define this uh, extension to all uh, bounded continuous maps. So, on such a row I have to define phi over long. Such a row can be split in, in, uh, as a difference of two positive uh, functionals. Uh, I'll write them here as row 1 minus row 2. Both positive. Now these positive maps are not yet states. I can define phi, phi is defined on states, so I have to turn these row 1 and row 2 into states by applying appropriate scalars to them. Uh, so uh, I'm assuming they're not zero because that's a trivial, trivial case I'm leaving out at this stage. And uh, I take out this multiplication factor, this uh, r, i is rho i of 1. And I obtain two states of uh, omega y by dividing by this uh, scalar 1 over rho i of 1. <coughs> now, to this omega i, I can apply phi. <coughs> I've scaled down these things. I can apply phi. And I have to rescale them to, to get a uh, good definition. So, what uh, I do is define overline phi rho is phi on this omega 1, omega 2, and then we scale with these factors I, I, I put inside to, uh, uh, <coughs> to get this work. Now remember phi is a affine continuous function. It's not a linear function. So you cannot just move this uh, uh, scalar in and out, <coughs> but you have to use uh, uh, the, the affine property that it preserves affine combinations. Uh, the, uh, convex combination. If you write it and this, oh, oh. if you write this out, you get this complicated expression. The next step is now to prove a number of elementary thing, things. First, that this phi over line is well defined, so that it doesn't depend on the row one and row two. Uh, this requires some work. Then that it's linear and also that it extends the original phi. 
This can all be done, and the crucial thing you have to use here is that Y itself is an affine map. <coughs> Good. So we have this extension. The next step is to prove that it's continuous, that it's weakly continuous, because then I can uh, apply this, uh, this duality. And this is where the quine smullian theorem comes in. The quine smullian theorem says the following, that if I have a complete order unit space, <coughs> So here complete and, and is important. Then uh, in order to prove that a function of V sharp to R is weakly continuous, it's sufficient to prove this for each ball uh, uh, of elements below uh, of norm below R. Um, okay, so that makes life a bit easier. We only have to do this for for the uh, restricted uh, for the restricted subset. Now the general result of the Schrein-Smullian theorem is not, not formulated for such a V-sharp, but for Banach spaces, so complete uh, uh, norm spaces, but I'll just formulate it in the way I, I need it here. And the proof is non-trivial, but not very insightful. Uh, it's, it's really fiddling with uh, details and uh, not, not very conceptual. It can be found in several places in the functional analysis uh, literature in slightly different formulations. But. Good. <coughs> so where are we? We have this phi overline <coughs> from V sharp to R. Uh, we know it's linear, but we need to show that it's briefly continuous. And uh, uh, according to quine smullian it's sufficient to show that its restriction to R is weakly continuous for such an arbitrary R. So let's try to do this. We take a net, <coughs> and we have to show that it's a uh, uh, phi over line that shows the limit of this uh, net. Now you have to go through the whole construction of this phi over line. That means split, split the input into uh, two positive parts as a difference, rescale them. Uh, this is a bit of bureaucracy. I will not go through uh, the details. So you split mu of r of this <coughs> net in a uh, positive and negative, and also the, the outcome, the limit, you have to split. You have to rescale it, but once you rescale it, <coughs> the factors for your rescaling will end up in this closed domain. And the reason for this is because in the beginning we assume this, uh, this, this limit is in here, and then the, the whole net is in here. And the important thing is that we can now turn this new into a other net, which in a, is in a in a product of compact spaces. At this stage, you can then uh, uh, claim that there must be a converging subnet, and using this converging subnet, you can actually prove that the, uh, uh, the limit is preserved. And so, so the crucial step here is to go from this, this restriction to compact spaces here, in which you can take the converging uh, subnet. That's it. So, Finally, the uh, Gettysburg duality, uh, there is an equivalence of categories between this Barnack order unit space and complex compact Hausdorff space. Done. Uh, this was my goal for uh, uh, the, the lectures. And uh, since I have some time left, I'll, I'll put things a bit more in uh, perspective. Uh, uh, what is that? First of all, <coughs> the reason why I'm interested in this is this uh, wider setting in the, in the context of C-star algebra. So you get this triangle where, uh, given a C-star algebra, the self joints can be seen as observables or predicates, and uh, they are in duality with the states, and the states end up as, as compact, compact uh, household states. Now these triangles uh, I'm interested in because they give a uh, a general pattern for state and, uh, and predicate transformer semantics. For instance, you can see this also if you look at uh, uh, non-deterministic computation. Uh, non-deterministic computation is done in a classically category of a power set monad. Um, <coughs> the Eilenberg more category of this, uh, of this monad is a category of complete lattices with uh, uh, joint preserving maps. This category is, in, uh, is equivalent to the category of complete uh, lattices of uh, 
meat preserving maps because of corn preserving map in this direction, which is a meat, uh, uh, meat preserving map in the other direction. Predicates transform us in, in Lexcon's weakest precondition as semantics, preside, precisely if you maps in these categories, and they are obtained from this function. And by uh, the same the same general analysis idea can be applied in the quantum setting, but this gives you weakest precondition semantics, and this gives you uh, the state transformer semantics. This basically is also what underlies your earlier work on weakest precondition semantics and uh, also of uh, in uh, to a certain extent. So this is the semantic basis of uh, these kind of things, and I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm sort of happy to see that the same structure uh, occurs the same the fundamental structure because in quantum semantics, just like in, in non-deterministic semantics. And by the way, you can draw similar diagrams for probabilistic computation using the classic test of the distribution monad or of the GD monad or of other structures. Okay, <coughs> what I um, also would like to briefly mention then is Yosida, or sometimes called Yosida Stone, Stone Yosida duality. Uh, which is about these spaces. <coughs> it's very clear to what uh, I've done so far, and I might as well discuss it briefly now. So a Ries space is a, a vector space, uh, an order vector space, which also has a, has a join uh, of vectors. So your equivalence there is actually, so that's, that's, that's sort of like an edge one. Yeah, there's an so adjoint of which unit or unit so are more forces so on the left, you really the previous process is going backward and on the right this process yeah. is going forward. Yeah, in the in the beginning I associated also uh, Schrödinger with this side and Heisenberg with this side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And what's interesting <laughs> is that in in this base category there is this opposite. Right? So I, try to argue before, and you always have to take the opposite of the category of C star algebra to see the interesting structure. And the C star algebra is also capture quantum uh, computation in backwards form, uh, which, which, which we sort of know already. But that's captured by the fact that in the base category you have an opposite. <coughs> Any further questions about this? Okay, so so just to comment, like in the, in, in the late 90s, Isar Stubbe and myself, we wrote papers where we actually interpreted orthomodularity in terms of this adjunction. Yeah. It's equivalent to have this adjoint, two projections, as, to as, as having orthomodularity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe I'm answer, answering too quickly, and uh, I do like to see a reference. Uh, uh, see what precisely happens. But I'll come back to uh, projections. Uh, so you see that uh, it's about Ries spaces, vector spaces with a joint, and uh, I'll write B R B A Ries, the subcategory of all, uh, 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 bar order unit spaces for the complete Ries spaces, which are also Archimedean. So Archimedean means that there is a unit which behaves well, so that you, you can every, squeeze everything in uh, and uh, use the unit to prove things <coughs> a lot positively. Uh, and the, uh, main, uh, the, the main difference is that you have a joint here. Right? So for the rest, the spaces are very simple. Uh, you see that Stone says that there is a duality with compact house of spaces, uh, of these real spaces. And the construction is very similar. You home into the real numbers uh, to get states, and the other <coughs> where you take continuous maps from a compact, compact house of space to the reals. Uh, notice you take continuous maps, not the affine uh, uh, maps. Uh, 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 that doesn't work in this setting because affine maps are not closed under this joint operation. <coughs> Good. Yeah? Um, do you have a more general picture of paramagnetic functions of which this is a hyperfix? No, I, I, no, I don't. I do have this picture. Trying to, to relate uh, <laughs> the, the categories. Uh, so, in fact, so there are two equivalents. This one is Scatterson, this is then Yosida. And interesting, 
on this direction you forget, and here you forget in the, in the other uh, direction. So here you have more structure, and also here you have more structure. Now this function has a left eye joint, which is the rod of monad, as I uh, briefly mentioned a few times, I'll, I'll come back to it later. And interestingly, this commutes. So forgetting here is the same as going like this, taking the rod of monad and going like this again. And that involves a duality, actually, that some, some of the constructions uh, cancel out. Now, if this diagram commutes, then the conclusion is that, <coughs> that this adjoint can be transported to this side because of the equivalences. Because I have ops here, uh, hang on, uh, this one corresponds to this, so this right adjoint can be transferred to this side, and if I remove the ops, it becomes a left adjoint. So my conclusion is that there is a left or joint from uh, Barnard order unit spaces to Barnard Armenian pre spaces, which adds uh, a, a, a joint. Uh, what it is, I cannot tell on the spot, but it's simply going through the diagram. Right? Uh, like this. Well, that's all. Yeah? Continue assumptions on the safe space. Yeah, continuous functions on the safe space. Yeah, probably that's it. It's not so difficult, eh? because you do this, you forget, and you do yeah, thanks. Um, I like, <coughs> since I still have a half an hour, we can either have a, have a break now or I can still tell you a little bit about C star algebra, which formed a broader setting uh, uh, of this work. And I, uh, uh, I'm happy to tell you a little bit about that. So, uh, especially I'll focus on morphisms between C star algebra, because that is a an interesting topic in itself that I've been looking at the, in the last few years. So traditionally, C star algebras are studied in combination with so-called star homomorphisms. I'll describe them in detail in a minute. However, there are good reasons to, to look also at other uh, morphisms, namely the positive unit of maps, the UP maps. And the reasons are the probabilistic nature of, of uh, these kind of maps, and also their relation to is all the unit space and an effect elsewhere. Um, my goal now is to explain a bit about these differences, where they arise, what, uh, 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 where you can see this, and maybe, maybe also promote these UP maps a little bit. But I'm not going to sell anything here, maybe point to some differences. <coughs> and I know there's a substantial difference between positive and completely positive maps, but that does not play a big role in my Um, I call a map a linear map between C star algebra unital if it preserves the unit. For me, C star algebra always have a unit. And I guess, uh, by the way, an interesting variation to, to look at maps which are subunital, so that F1 is below 1, they become in probabilistic terms to sub distributions. And uh, uh, they're interesting because they have more uh, order structure, just like uh, for. Uh, density matrices that you require that the trace is less than one to get more order structure. And actually a PCD student of mine has a, there are two PCD students of mine working on uh, this topic, uh, Matisse Renala and Kenta Cho, and they both have independently similar results, which roughly say that the category of W star algebra, so a subcategory of C star algebra with completely positive subunit maps, it is algebraically compact in the sense of power. Uh, so, so you have coincidence there of, of uh, initial algebra and final co algebra, which I find intuitively a reasonably uh, uh, natural result because these algebra compact countries have arisen so far in situations where you have order completeness in these CPO life structures, or where you have metric completeness in metric spaces. And these double U star algebras sort of combine the two, where you have both a complete order and a complete match. Yes? Which sort of factors have? Uh, the uh, sort of standard uh, locally continuous uh, uh, functors you have to use. Are so there natural examples of the writer recursive equation? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, it's an ongoing work. The, the uh, challenge is to get infinite lists. In there uh, and to use those uh, for, uh, for next.
next steps in, in the program. Yeah. So that's uh, ongoing work indeed. But the construction is there, and that's in uh, MFDS uh, appearing in two weeks. Uh, the next uh, requirement is positive. The map is positive if it preserves positive elements or equivalently if it's monotone. Uh, or what is as a P? It's multiplicative if it preserves the multiplication. And uh, finally, it's involutive written as I if it preserves the involution. An easy lemma is then UP implies I, so unit on a positive implies uh, uh, involutive. And Mu uh, implies UP. Uh, and I'll, I will be using these two categories, C star Mu and C star UP, UP uh, uh, of unit of positive, uh, positive maps and the multiplication of unit of maps. And these Mu maps are traditionally called star homomorphisms. They are the kind of morphisms that people have really studied. Uh, for instance, in Galvan duality. Oh. Uh, so, so compact isosceles space equivalent to commutative C star algebras with these star homomorphisms. But an interesting question happens: what, what if you replace here mu with up? Now let's see some examples. Uh, oh. Oh, this should really come later. Something went wrong in the. Maybe I should later get this off. Let's see what happens. Anyway, this is an interesting result uh, uh, in itself. Uh, the uh, mu maps from the complex numbers from n to n, from c to the n and from c to the m, they correspond to functions from n to n. Right, so, so these mu maps are really very receptive, at least in this uh, finite three case. And uh, my point is that maybe they are too receptive. Be computationally interested. And uh, a formalization of this is that finite sets correspond to finite dimensional commutative C star algebra with these mu maps and that uh, How do you prove this? Well, <coughs> one uh, way is uh, a simple, let's uh, briefly go through this to, to see if, uh, where you use this. So if I have a mu map like this, I take a base, standard base vector. Uh, this base factor multiplied by itself is itself, so phi of this multiplied with itself is also phi of this. So if phi is such a sequence of, of uh, numbers, then they must be either 0 or 1. And they, they must be very simple already. This multiplication property is very powerful and forces the structure to be very trivial. Now for the rest, uh, the sum of these kind of things is 1. So the sum of these phi's is one. So the, in these all of these r y's, there's precisely one, which uh, which is uh, one, and this gives me a function from n to, to n. In contrast, the up maps, the unital uh, positive maps from c to the power n to c to the power n, they correspond to functions from n to the distribution of n from n. Uh, this is the discrete distribution monad. So in there, in this unit of positive maps, there is uh, the, the idea of probability uh, built in. And this can also be uh, uh, de described as a, as a Gelfand duality, the classically category of the distribution uh, monad, when I restrict the objects to the natural numbers to finite sets, that corresponds to finite dimensional commutative C star algebra with the unit of positive. And uh, more abstractly, this shows that this uh, is uh, C star algebra from the Lovia theory of this uh, the distribution. Uh, the proof I'll skip because it basically is the same. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday already, uh, with Robert, we tried to uh, generalize this. We did find the Radon monad on a category of uh, compact house of spaces, Radon of X is the unit of positive <coughs> maps on C of X, which again is, is a compact uh, house so it gives you an endo function, and then you can prove that the classic category is, is uh, uh, describing this one. Again, here's the unit of positive maps. Um, what 
has disappeared from my slides uh, is uh, the, the following observation, the following differences which are worth mentioning. If I take Hilbert spaces with unitary maps, and form this into a cat tree, that gives me a functor to C star uh, mu. Spaces and I don't take the unitary map but isometries. Then I go to, uh, to not mu but mu p. Don't have to get used to it. The unit of positive maps. Actually, you go to the unit of completely positive maps, but that's uh, that side. <coughs> so different maps between uh, the spaces give you different maps here between. Another observation that's uh, uh, maybe worthwhile to make, if I take a complex number, C square, and take maps to a C star algebra, and I look at the mu maps, what do they correspond to? Uh, the projections on A. in the unit interval, uh, the positive below the unit, and these are the elements which additionally satisfy p square is p. Projections are the effects which satisfy p square. So here again you see uh, clear differences between mu and mu p. I'd like to tell a little bit about effect algebra, because that's a topic I've been working on uh, also recently. And, uh, build the relation with C star algebras and some other structures as well. So effect algebras say axiomatize the unit interval <coughs> 0, 1 in a certain way. And in particular, uh, if you, you notice that the addition of the unit interval is a partial operation. So, so you like to capture this in a partial commutative monoid is a structure which has a zero element, a partial operation which I will write as this V with a circle around it, which is commutative and associative in a suitable partial sense. And uh, I'll write this x y for orthogonality, which simply means that the uh, sum is defined. <coughs> now, effect algebra is such a partial commutative monoid in which each element has a unique orthosupper. There is a unique element that you can add to it such that you get one and one is the complement. And that's a technical size condition. And once you have this, you get a partial order on it, and it's reasonably well behaved mathematical structure. What are main examples? Uh, projections of closed subspaces on a Hilbert space, they form an effect uh, algebra, uh, where complement is given in the usual way. This can be generalized to automodular lattices. They uh, form a uh, Effect algebra where the join is really made into a, a partial operation, where the, uh, it's only defined to two elements for which uh, this relation uh, holds. So, in an orthomodular lattice, the join is totally defined, but, but when you translate it to an effect algebra, you, you forget this definition in some parts. Each Boolean algebra is also an effect uh, <coughs> algebra where two elements are orthogonal if their intersection is, is zero. And this is typically what you use in the context of uh, measurable spaces. And indeed, these effect algebras have been developed in theoretical physics in an attempt to get to, to axiomatize probability theory for the quantum world. Uh, what are maps of effect algebras? There are functions between the underlying sets, such that f1 is 1, and the sum is preserved whenever it exists. This gives me a category of effect algebras. And for instance, there is a functor from measurable spaces into these effect algebras. And uh, probability measure uh, can be also gives rise to a 
to the map of reflected algebra where this is a crucial point that, that uh, non-empty uh, uh, joints are preserved, which is precisely what you applied to them. To actually <laughs> so the empty joints are preserved. <laughs> and what is an effect module? An effect module is an effect algebra where you have scalar multiplication. So it's a bit like a vector space, but you don't do scalar multiplication with the reals or the complex numbers, but with the uh, uh, probabilities, zero, one. You can generalize this to uh, multiplication with the so-called effect monoid, which is an effect algebra which additionally has multiplication, but in most cases it's just zero one. An effect module is then a, a module with respect to this uh, structure. That's the scalar multiplication, which is suitable by monoid. Okay, I'll write emot for the resulting category. What are the main examples? We have probabilistic examples. So fuzzy predicates on a set uh, x, I can look at the functions on x to unit interval 0, 1. And this gives me a uh, uh, factor as well with this kind of scalar multiplication. Point one. Measurable predicates is in, in a sense an extension of this. And quantum examples are effects on my Hilbert space, which are the, the positive maps below the identity. And again, this generalizes to effects in a C star algebra. Uh, good. <laughs> there are full and faithful functors now uh, from C star algebra with these unit of positive maps to effect modules and also to order unit space. Again, this works for uh, unit on positive uh, maps precisely because such maps are preserved precisely by what they do on the uh, positive elements. And these functors then form part of this triangle uh, that I discussed a few times. There's one aspect I <coughs> would like to, to conclude with, is that these uh, states and these effects they have a very fairly canonical description <coughs> inside, inside this, in this category. So states can be described as uh, maps from <coughs> as points, basically, from, from one to these elements. And this works because in the category of C star as well as op, C is, uh, is the, the, the complex numbers from the, the final object 1. On this side, effects can be described as uh, maps into 1 plus 1. And uh, I'd like to conclude with this, and this is a sneak preview uh, to what I will be talking about uh, this weekend. This idea of describing predicates as maps to 1 plus 1, I'd like to exploit this a bit more. Uh, it's <coughs> Somehow goes against the. It looks too simple when you when you start looking at that and this. Probably because we are spoiled by topos theory, where we look into uh, maps into from x to omega, and omega is much more structured. And one plus one looks so simple. I mean, this can't can't be relevant. Still, I'll, I'd like to give you a few examples where uh, this does have some relevant structure. Obviously, in sets itself, maps from x to 1 plus 1 are the ordinary predicates, but, uh, sometimes identified with their characteristic functions. If you do this in the closely category of the distribution monad, a map from 1 plus 1, which are often one and 2, that in closely uh, of D, that corresponds to an actual function to D of 2. And uh, D is the distribution, distribution monad on a two element set, and this is simply 0, 1. So what you, what you get out are the, the fuzzy predicates uh, in this way. And here suddenly you have a bit more structure. It's, a, it's not completely trivial, it's maps to 1 plus 1. In uh, C star algebra, but off, you get the effects. My next example is uh, rings. rings. Does anyone want to get, guess what you get as predicates in rings? You have to use ring op or give away. So let, let's go through this in detail. What's the initial object in rings? N. Z. Z. That's semi rings. Semi rings. And it's a. So 
Z is initial in, in uh, ring, so it's final in ring op. What is plus in ring op? Well, that's just times. So, so 1 plus 1 is z times z. But translating this all back, this corresponds to z square ring homomorphisms to r in ring. What are these? Any idea? I'm pretty sure you'll say, oh, yes. They're, they're elements r. multiplication, uh, so it, it gives me an item item potent element. In the other direction, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> it's not so difficult uh, to see that if I uh, R given, I define F and N and M to be N times R plus N times 1 minus R. <coughs> and this is a ring homomorphism for which you crucially have to show that this is an item potent. Now the item potents in the ring if you know your Johnson uh, uh, very well, they form a Boolean algebra. And so you, you, you see that this, this structure on the predicates here is not, uh, not completely uh, trivial and, and makes some sense. Uh, okay, so in Did the always form a Boolean algebra? Yeah, no, no, no. The no, general no. result I will describe tomorrow is that they will always form an effect. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the maps from x to 1 plus 1 are always in effect mode. And that shows that the, 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 it's a fairly natural construction, a fairly natural way that these kind of things emerge. In some cases, they form a Boolean algebra, but not, for instance, in the C star algebra case or in the, in the fuzzy predicate case. <coughs> in sense, of course, they do form a Boolean algebra. Now, my last example is dis uh, uh, distributive lattices. Distributive lattices of. What are the predicates in distributed lattices of? What, think of it just uh, for a moment intuitively. What would you think? Probably it would give a Boolean algebra structure. So what would be, they be? <coughs> the elements that have a complement. Uh, so so uh, let's, let's briefly go through this. So what is uh, what is initial uh, initial object in distributed lattices? Two, yeah, two, two element set. Uh, so uh, x to one plus one in D mod op. That corresponds to match from T two times two to L. Uh, when you call it L for lattice. And what are these? If you if you look at this a little bit, they correspond to x and l with x prime such that <coughs> x x prime is zero, x join x prime as well. So they have a complement. So there are, in two times two there are four elements. Top and bottom must go to top and uh, bottom, and the other two elements will form each other's complement. So you see, so it's again quite natural to look at these kind of maps. They also, <coughs> when there is such a complement, it's unique in the distributive lattice by the distributivity property. And uh, uh, they also form a sub Boolean algebra of the distributive lattice. I'm curious if you know uh, uh, more examples. Uh, one thing I'm also curious about, and maybe some of you. Someone of you can tell me. I, in the previous picture, if you go back to this, uh, I, I said here the states are points. And if I translate this back to, to rings, what are the states? The states are ring homomorphisms to Z. What are they? Are they also some sort of characters? Or, or do they form a spectrum for rings? 
Are they used in duality theory? Does anyone know? If so, I, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear about that. Given the, the general character of this uh, theory, I, I'm pretty sure they must have some, some relevant meaning. But I don't know what it is. So, I conclude here, distributed lattices, the predicates are elements which have a complement of former Boolean algebra, and this concludes. <laughs> Structures on both sides, so predicates and, and density matrices of the state, and you have a way of, of translating back and forth between them. And that translation is precisely the, what you have in the uh, equivalence. Yeah, is that it? Okay, nice to hear some more uh, about your own work. <laughs> Are you in this picture? No. <laughs> so how would you do it? Yeah, like the comment there are like old papers going back to the 90s in Geneva School of Quantum Logic, yeah. where this sort of idea for the backward start to become exploited to prove stuff. Okay. This goes really back to the to the eighties. There is already a quantum logic is there. Yeah. So and most of these papers are very obscure in a journal which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, yeah. And probably mostly in terms of projection. Always. Yeah, always. Now, uh, one of the reasons that I'll show you also tomorrow that affects uh, form a more general class, that it's closer to some relevant operations, uh, uh, which is, we don't have for projection. Mm -hmm. But that's also a reason why I prefer to use uh, effects. Thanks again.